just noticed an interesting news story in relation to the present governor of Iowa stating that neither he or Mr. Eisenhower were responsible for the drop. Well, I think that's right. I don't believe that he or Mr. Eisenhower are quite the folks that could hold back the rain clouds and such. I am a little critical of this. Those drought conditions were used by the present governor to make many newspaper headlines. The calling of the governor's conference of eight Republican governors, you know, were an item of headlines pretty much. I think the only thing that was accomplished was a tremendous waste of flash bulbs while the photographers were interviewing those particular individuals. It was interesting that Governor Freeman of Minnesota, who happens to be a Democrat, wasn't also in this Midwest Conference of Governors. But I think that the important thing to Iowa is our problems in relation to Iowa taxation. To go back a little bit, we must recognize that Iowa income has been decreasing rapidly in the past three years, in fact. And we must realize that the farm income has slipped from its high earnings place in Iowa economy down to the point that it's only earning 16 and 4 tenths percent of all the dollars earned by all the folks in Iowa. So when we talk about progress, we must talk about our people, how well off they are individually, how well they're progressing from an economy standpoint. When we recognize that Iowa folks' income is far below the national average, in fact, in last year alone, with the national income up 7%, Iowa went down 5%. Yet Iowa's taxes in that same period since 1953 up to now have increased from $146 per every individual up to $170. What we need in Iowa is not additional taxation. We need more income for our Iowa folks. The tax problem will then take care of itself. I strongly urge the 57th General Assembly to first take action designed to correct the present lack of balance in representation and second establish a dependable method which will facilitate future adjustments in representation without the lags which have persisted in recent decades. Therefore, I call upon the General Assembly to join with me in the establishment of an effective merit system for the state of Iowa by creating a Department of Civil Service. I propose further 
that the department be administered by an appointee of director of personnel whose regulations would be subject to the approval of a three-member Civil Service Commission, which would also be empowered to hear appeals in case of dismissal. I recommend that the General Assembly give special attention to, first, an expanded research program designed to enlarge the markets for Iowa's agricultural products, and to stimulate the development this can be accomplished by shifting emphasis from activities designed to increase output to those designed to the expansion of markets and the retention of a larger portion of the consumer's food dollar for the Iowa economy. Two, the ad adequacy of credit available to agricultural producers at prevailing interest rates and farm income levels, many of our farm producers are hampered by inadequate credit. Third, a program for the efficient utilization of water through the development of a more effective conservation measures, more adequate information on the availability of water resources, and a sound comprehensive water rights law which will protect the interests of all water users. put it in a nutshell, our Republican administration is now proof. For the first time in nearly 20 years, 30 years I should say, that we can have prosperity without war, full employment outside of uniform, and security without regimentation and control. And we're proud of that record. And we believe that the American people whom we represent are proud of it too. The American people are not going to stand still. They want progress. They want an administration which doesn't look to the past. They want one that isn't satisfied with the present. But they want one which by deeds even more than words shows the way to new and greater hope for the future. It seems to me that the birthday of the first Republican president is a particularly appropriate time for us all to remind ourselves of the fact that if we studied history carefully we would not need to be reminded of. And that is that the Republican Party in its greatest day has always been, and it is now, and it will continue to be the party of progress for America. I solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. The office of the President of the United States, that I will make. My fellow citizens, the world and we have passed the midway point of a century of continuing challenge. We sense with all our faculties that forces of good and evil are masked and armed and opposed as rarely before in history. This fact defines the meaning of this day. At such a time in history, we who are free must proclaim anew our faith. This faith rules our whole way of life. It decrees that we, the people, elect leaders not to rule, but to serve. Number one, abhorring war as a chosen way to block the purposes of those who threaten us, we hold it to be the first task of statesmanship to develop the strength that will deter the forces of aggression and promote the conditions of peace. In the light of this principle, 
we stand ready to engage with any and all others in joint effort to remove the causes of mutual fear and distrust among nations so as to make possible drastic reduction of armaments. And in our quest for an honorable peace, we shall neither compromise nor tire nor ever cease. This is the hope that beckons us onward in this century of trial. This is the work that awaits us all, to be done with bravery, with charity, and with prayer to Almighty God. My citizens, I thank you. Your officers have taken me through the tent where we have been there, where they are showing exactly how much feed it takes to produce a thousand pounds of beef and put it on the city uh, workers table. I have learned a lot. If I could stay longer, I would learn much more. And finally, my friends, I come today to pay my respects to the plow. Ever since I had the invitation to this meeting, I have been trying to think in my mind of some instrument invented by man that has meant more to them than the plow. I can think of none. In fact, the plow has become the symbol for peace. And now, my friends, I trust that no matter what my duties in the future are, that I can come back more and more frequently to these national field days that you have. President and Mrs. Eisenhower, Vice President and Mrs. Nixon, and there is Senator Stiles Bridges on the far left. They pour get close to the president. The president's car, plexiglass top, and Secret Service flanking, making progress down Pennsylvania Avenue, but with reasonable slowness so that the crowds may see Mrs. Eisenhower, for instance, as she waves to them, and the president grinning broadly giving a sort of semi-military salute through the fact he was taking as active a part in this second inaugural of President Eisenhower's as his health will permit. He was invited by the president to sit in the reviewing box, the president's reviewing... Platform. Ruffles and flourishes, the familiar greeting by the United States Marine Band. Oh, 
On his left is Senator Stiles Bridges, the Republican chairman of the inauguration committee, and on the president's right, Mayor I, Richard M. Nixon, do solemnly swear. I, Richard M. Nixon, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Dwight D. Eisenhower, do solemnly swear. I, Dwight D. Eisenhower, do solemnly swear. That you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability. And will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Thank you very much. We meet again, as upon a like moment four years ago, and again, you have witnessed my solemn oath of service to you. I, too, am a witness today testifying in your name to the principles and purposes to which we, as a people, are pledged. Across all continents, nearly a billion people seek, sometimes almost in desperation, for the skills and knowledge and assistance by which they may satisfy from their own resources the material wants common to all mankind. Budapest is no longer merely the name of a city, henceforth, it is a new and shining symbol of man's yearning to be free. <laughs> and beyond this general resolve, we are called to act a responsible role in the world's great concerns or conflicts. Whether they touch upon the affairs of a vast region, the fate of an island in the Pacific, or the use of a canal in the Middle East.
I think we need to take a new look at legislative representation, recognizing that this Constitution of ours is not a fad. It's something that was created 100 years ago, guaranteeing you and I equalization of representation. I think we need to recognize that this democracy as we know it is not a fair fad. It's something that's guaranteeing us equalization of representation in a government of and for and by the people. I can see no end of success that we can attain if we that are the farm areas, if we are the urban areas, recognize our potential power as a unified group of people working for a future, labor man, businessman, and farmer working together. <laughs>